Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have an Episcopal friend who's troubled by some health issues, so he's usually up very early in the morning. And he sends me a message almost every day. And one of the memes that he sent just a couple of days ago was a picture of a rather wild-looking John the Baptist. And it was captioned, Merry Christmas, you brood of vipers. Now that meme is not insignificant in that it recognizes something often missed in the telling of Matthew's gospel story. That is, in the ongoing controversy between the religious authorities and John the Baptist and following him, Jesus, it was John who made the first stroke. <clears throat> the meme also reminds us that in the telling of John the Baptist's story, there are three sets of people here that we're dealing with. John, the religious leaders, and the people. Now, memes can, can never really tell the full story. And what they don't tell us here is that the people from Judea, from Jerusalem, and all of the region of Jordan not only came out to hear John, but they did, in fact, heed his call and dutifully went into the Jordan to receive the baptism of repentance. He was not calling this crowd of expectant and obedient souls a brood of vipers. That he reserved for those who had not done the task of looking after God's people. No, these were people that John knew. He had grown up with them. He commiserated with them. He knew the difficulty of their lives. And he saw and knew in his own mind's eye that the promised Messiah was in fact promised to these people. It was their misery the Messiah would bring to an end and their lives that would be restored to fullness and to hope. There's also something else to consider by the way the story of John the Baptist plays out. The difficulty we have with Advent was also a challenge in John's own ministry. And the challenge for us is that we're always trying here in the church to keep Advent and Christmas separate seasons. We want Advent to be here for four weeks, and then we want to celebrate the 12 days of Christmas. But you know how it goes. You barely get the first Advent candle lit when you're hearing Christmas carols on every corner and you can't escape the Christmas season. In the Gospel, according to Matthew, even as John comes into the wilderness of Judea and preaches his baptism of repentance, Jesus suddenly appears on the scene so that they're faced by the very same thing. Just as we finish hearing the words, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire, we then read, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan. So it seems that just as people today begin their preparation and just as the people who came out to hear John were beginning their preparation, the incarnation is upon us all. And what this means is that there is barely time for us and there was barely time for them to live out the repentance and to do something with the expectation that filled their hearts. At best, they and we might be able to do perhaps one important thing to demonstrate our willingness to be led in that new direction to open up our hearts to the coming of the Christ. Now, this is not necessarily bad news because let's face it, or I can say this at least for me, 
that when I start to list out all of the things that I would like to change about myself or about my life, I would soon be overwhelmed with the list as it grew longer and longer and longer with each passing day to the point where I would be not only overwhelmed but in the state of absolute and utter despair. And I think one of the worst things that pastors can do and one of the mistakes that we all make at times is to go through that long list of things in the world that need to be changed. Oh, standing here, it can make me feel a whole lot better to get it all off my chest, but it really doesn't do any good for anyone sitting out there. And in fact, you would all come to realize the very same thing, that there are so many things that need to be changed that it won't even be worth it to try because it simply cannot be done. And maybe this is the point, after all. Because we don't enter into the new life in Christ through works righteousness. We enter the new life in Christ because we are called by Christ out of his own love for us and by his grace. So perhaps rather than trying to repair everything that seems wrong, we need to truly bask in the grace of Jesus Christ and focus on the future and the things that we might actually do to live out God's vision for us and for the world. Well, as we look at the gospel this morning, certainly we don't really want to identify with those whom John called out and called a brood of vipers. He did indeed strike the first blow because he was so dissatisfied with the leaders of his people. They were not just supposed to be in charge. They were supposed to nurture these people. They were supposed to shepherd the people. They were to care for them, and John didn't see any of that. And of course, they claimed privilege. They claimed the privilege of being the sons of Abraham, and so they thought that that alone entitled them to a special place in God's kingdom. Well, don't be so sure of that, John said. God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Well, we don't want to be the brood of vipers, and I think we all want to be more than obedient children. Yes, indeed, they came out to the Jordan. They were baptized with the baptism of repentance. But don't we want to live lives that are more full than simply being obedient? Certainly we do. We want to be part of the kingdom of heaven. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. Well, it comes with or without us. But we pray that we can be a part of it and a vital part as well. I think if we're going to emulate someone in the gospel this morning, we truly, in the end, really want to emulate John, who took on the role of being God's prophet, who worked and called out tirelessly for a society that was brimming with justice. And he wasn't afraid to speak truth to power. You brood of vipers, for those who were not responsibly taking care of God's children, to his confrontation with Herod, overtaking his brother's wife as his own. So perhaps we can identify with John and instead of looking backward, look forward. Start thinking about what God intends for our lives and what God intends for the life of the world. What new direction would God have us take? What new direction is God calling us to? What path would God have us go down? Let's be thinking in terms of what God might have in mind. 
I think this is what Isaiah is getting at as he writes this morning, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. The vision Isaiah shares is a vision of God's justice for the whole world. The question for us is how do we make the metaphors in Isaiah's vision become reality in the world in which we live? You know, one of the most interesting things I find in this gospel is that John the Baptist comes into the world and his message seems so very harsh. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor. The chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And as he talks about Jesus, he says, the mightier one is coming, one who is mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. And then, of course, Jesus comes. And after all of us hearing about John's hard justice, Jesus comes on the scene and he doesn't want us to pick up and carry his sandals. That's not what he expects of us. He doesn't come into the world from a place of privilege. He comes into the world to show us how to serve and how to be reconciled with one another. Notice in this metaphor that Isaiah holds before us that the wolf, the lion, and the bear, the asp, and the adder, they are not destroyed. Instead, there is a reconciliation that takes place. So the lion lies down with the lamb, and the child can hold his hand over the adder's den and is not hurt. We're called to a repentance, to a turning around. We're not called to a zero-sum game where to lift one set of people up, we have to put down another set of people. And isn't it true that we really can't, in the end, force people to repent? When we try to force, whether it's me trying to force someone or you trying to force someone to change, when we do that and we begin to take from them, we really haven't changed anything. We've just begun a new round of oppression. No, in order to affect real change and real repentance, we have to change human hearts. And we can't do that forcibly. That can only be done by convincing people of the love of Jesus Christ and then helping them to reconcile themselves to the rest of the world and to their Savior. We cannot, perhaps, change the whole world in a short season, but we certainly can start down the road. We ourselves can repent turn around and begin this process of reconciliation. Perhaps you and I can find the person we have offended or find the person who has offended us. And we can reach out to them with forgiveness and reconciliation so that we begin to live out these metaphors so that as the kingdom of God breaks into the world, it breaks into our midst, into our lives. And we welcome the Lord 
as one who brings reconciliation and peace to the very center of our lives. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, guard our hearts and keep our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.